The site, of course, was this very beautiful piece of property that uh, had only the three original gun emplacements that have been put there for the last war. And um, the university gave us the choice of taking a quarter of that piece of property on one side of the gun emplacement or the other. And we found when we began to look at the total program in terms of size and bulk, there really wasn't enough property on one side or the other. On one side, towards the view, there was um, the danger of closeness to the cliffs and erosion. And on the other side, it was just too removed and too much against the existing marine drive. The landscape and the position of the villages were decided right at the very beginning, before we even started designing the building. And then it became obvious that um, the great hall or some great space would be needed to house the massive carvings that had to be stored inside, and that this would be the predominant element of the building, and that that in some way should jut out so that from the inside one looked past the poles and the inside to the village outside and the water beyond. And so the design was based on descending first to a kind of reception level, and then to descend again through very broad steps, and then to descend gently by way of ramp to the great hall, which thrust out between the gun emplacements. And it became obvious then that we needed the whole site. Then, when that decision had been made, the next decision was where to place the very fragile items, the very small items of the Kerner collection. And it seemed that it would be very effective to juxtapose them directly next to the massive carvings, so that you went from something that was very large in concept and scale to something which was very small, miniature, uh, precious, exquisite in scale. And so from the Great Hall, um, it seemed that one could build a narrow, low-ceilinged gallery, a more appropriate to the scale of these smaller objects. A lateral hall would take you back to a rotunda where the carving of Bill Reed's of the Haida legend of the creation would be placed right on the original gun emplacement where the gun originally sat.
totem park, the marvelous uh, massive carvings which sat outside had to be relocated near the new museum, and this would give us an opportunity to place them in a setting which was typical of the Northwest Coast. I had seen some photographs of the early villages and the way the poles were arranged and the house fronts were arranged on the edge of the beach between the sea and the forest. And really this gave me an insight into the actual art of the house front and the massive carvings themselves because you could see that suddenly they took the elements of the forest and they took the elements of the sea and made some kind of, um, of peace with them. After we had determined this location of spaces, all that remained was uh, really to enclose them and put a building around them. Because at that stage, we had also taken models of all of the massive carvings and located them on the site so that we knew what shape of space we had to build. Our objective in enclosing that great hall was to provide the massive carvings with a very simple background so that the color and the grain of the wood itself would be featured and also to place them in natural light as much as possible so that you would see the fall of light across the surface and you would see them against the natural setting as much as possible. My feeling from the beginning was that the poles themselves should stand against very simple surfaces and very broad surfaces, preferably of a gray concrete that would be not too different from the color of the poles. So at that time, we began to propose a kind of, almost a kind of post and beam structure. And I guess unconsciously, this was a repetition of the post and beam structure of the house frame that we'd used as an introduction to the poles. And we just made that structure very broad and low at the beginning of the space and very tall and narrow at the outer edge of the space and just repeated the basic system. And really, this is how this uh, really, I guess, quite unique and in many ways illogical, but nevertheless, I think, uh, impressive structure developed. In keeping with the idea of the village being shown in its natural setting, in keeping with the idea of the worship of the natural setting and the bounty of nature, we partially buried the building and roofed it with uh, the native broom so that the building itself would become as much of nature as possible. Then really the rest of the materials in the interior are very neutral. The gray carpet was purposely chosen so there'd be no contrast between the gray concrete, the gray carpet, and the silver gray of the poles. And I think it's very effective insofar as you get a sense of quiet in the museum. The beautiful texture and color of the wood reads very clearly. There's um, simplicity to all of the interiors that set off uh, the very rich imagery of the pieces in the collection. And of course,
course, right from the beginning, we had been in consultation with the curators of the museum, and one of the exciting results of that conversation was the idea of opening all of the storage area to the public and making it a kind of visible storage. So the objective was to really contrast the highly stylized display of the massive carvings, the Kerner collection, and the theater with an open display area where objects were just placed on pegboards, catalogued, and with reference catalogs available to the public so that anyone coming into that storage area would see the whole collection. And it seemed that we'd actually be bringing the public into the whole experience. Although it is a uh, magnificent and could be overpowering structure where the artifacts that it houses could be lost completely, whether through the genius of the designer, and this very possibly could be so, because I believe Arthur Erickson is a superb designer of public spaces, or perhaps just because of the power of the objects themselves, they are not overwhelmed, and the two quite different types of design uh, complement each other beautifully. I, I suppose because they they are austere and and uh, so concerned with abstract design principles, and in, each in its own way.
think we, we can't even begin to comprehend just how skillful the uh, native people had to be in order to survive. I think the Northwest Coast Canoe is a supreme example. It was absolutely essential to their continued existence to be able to navigate the uh, waters of the Northwest Coast, which are not all that calm and pacific at all times. The canoe was, was one of the most ingenious artifacts that probably anybody ever uh, attempted. I find the, the museum, as it's presently set up, a source of continuing interest. That, in spite of the fact that I've known that collection for 25 years now and have handled most of the pieces perhaps all of the pieces, certainly all the pieces I'm really interested in, and being able to pick them up and, and observe them in detail, I still find it a very interesting experience to go back time and time again to, to the museum to see these familiar things. And I think they are permitted to speak entirely for themselves and display themselves in all their various layers of meaning and that is the great attribute of the fine Northwest Coast pieces, or any piece of art as far as that goes, that it doesn't give itself easily to the uh, viewer. It, it reveals itself over a period of time, layer by layer, and eventually becomes a part of the consciousness of the person who takes the time to become thoroughly acquainted with it.